new song, it brought to my mind a prayer that was kept in a notebook of a soldier in World War I. And his, I wish I could remember it exactly, and I can't, but his prayer basically was, Lord, I will cling to you, but should I lose my hold, please cling to me. That song reminds me of that. I'm going to ask Pastor Poroshka to come up. Now, last time Pastor Poroshka was here, in her sermon, come on up, in her sermon, she actually happened to mention that she grew up in a communist country and touched ever so briefly on it. But after the service, many people were saying, oh, I'd love to know what it was like. I'd love to hear what her experience was. And so I'm going to just ask her one question. And what we're going to do before she goes on to the sermon she has prepared for us is to ascertain whether we would like her to come back next year and tell us more fully and in greater detail what life was like for her. So my question to her at the moment is, what were the difficulties you faced growing up in a communist country and then coming to faith? Oh, how long is a piece of string, Denise? <laughs> um, look, growing up under communism was normal because that's what I was born under. And those of you might have heard uh, rumors about it. It was different in every part of communism. Um, my greatest difficulty was my dysfunctional family. Uh, I still don't know who my father is. And my mother was an alcoholic, an aggressive one, so life wasn't uh, all that good at home. Spent a lot of time on the streets with friends. And, and as you grow up and become a teenager, you try to figure out what is the purpose of life? What, why am I here for? You know, that's the underlying question. And I was 13 when my first friend died, and a year later, the other one had a serious accident. And uh, I remember standing at that funeral, and the three of us were close friends. Uh, believe it or not, I was into, into orienteering, uh, running an international level, because I, I figured, like, if I have fame, you know, I'll be happy. No, it didn't work. Then I thought, maybe if I have money, then I'll be happy. It didn't work. And you try all these different things. And I was standing at her funeral, and the three of us were the top runners in the county. And here it comes, within a year, two of them are gone. And I'm thinking, standing at that funeral as a 14-year-old, and I'm thinking, am I next? And uh, what's after death? Uh, so my quest began. And I started searching, you know, what's after death? And uh, I brushed by supernatural. I went to a spiritual seance, and I figured out, oh, yep, yeah, there are supernatural forces. Luckily, it freaked me out, and I stepped back from it, and I let my friends continue with their, yeah, yeah making the table move, etc., getting answers from ancestors, etc. But I didn't get involved in that. And, and as I searched more and more, uh, the pastor from Australia, from Melbourne, Pastor Tony Campbell, arrived to my hometown together with a group of Australian young people who said, communism fell, so we're going to take the gospel to these ex-communist countries. Within a year, they showed up in my hometown, uh, home city. And, um, and uh, as I attended those meetings, although communism politically fallen, the mentality hasn't. And, and that's what I came across, because when I went to those meetings, and it's a, maybe next time I'll tell you about how I meant to be at those meetings, which I didn't plan on. When I heard Pastor Campbell talk about God, I, I just, everything just fell into place. When he first talked about creation, I said, that makes sense. You know, that makes sense, everything makes sense, and I gave my heart to God. And I could keep it secret for a while, until I, it came to my baptism. And on the day of my baptism, my mother told me, if you get baptized, don't come home. And she didn't say it with this tone. 
and um, and I knew that my numbers at home were uh, my days at home were counted, and soon I left home. Uh, and and on the day of my baptism, although I didn't go home until 2 a.m., I just wanted to make sure she was asleep. Um, on the day of my baptism, after that was the last night when Pastor Campbell finished his series, and he asked me, he came up to me, he came up to me with the translator. I didn't speak English at that time. You know, we had to learn German and Russian and all that, but not English. And he comes up to me and he starts talking to me. And I tell you, I could understand what he was saying. And I was praying, God, no, 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 no way. Can you please make sure the translator says something different? And no, she said exactly the same thing. He asked me to give my testimony that night. And I said, wow, my teachers will be sitting in that congregation of hundreds of people. My, my, my mother's colleagues will be sitting there. I said, no matter what I'm going to say, I'm going to pay for it in the coming days and weeks. And um, as a nervous, I, I was so shy. I still am. I'm an introvert. So public speaking is actually pushing me a bit hard, you know, just to be up here. And, uh, and uh, I spent the next 45 minutes trying to write down three sentences that made sense. That when I get up on that stage, if I read those three sentences, that will be my testimony. And I wrote those three sentences, and then I tried to memorize them. And when it came for me to step on that stage and share it, they just all went out of my mind. And I remember standing there looking at these people, all the lights in your eyes, so luckily you can't see facial expressions, and I didn't know what to do. I was standing there, and I, not a single word came out of my mouth. Then I looked at him, and he just gave me that nod. It's OK, go. And there was a tear in his eyes. And I'm, I started talking. And up to this day, I don't know what I said. I honestly don't know what I said. But when I came off, some of the people asked me, would you like a recording of, you know, of what you said? I said, no, no, never want to hear it. Never want to hear it. A few years ago, I went back, and now there is a big church. There was no church, and now there is a big church there uh, in Hungarian standards. And I went there, and we were sitting around in the afternoon. They wanted to ask me questions about this and that, just, just to understand my journey, becoming a pastor, and on the other side, it, pastoring in the other side of the world. And uh, at one point, there were three people who said that, you know, Piroshka, your testimony, and my eyes, ooh, someone remembers, that's not good. And they said, that was the point where we decided that, yes, we want to follow God after listening to your testimony. And I'm like, what? Somebody actually, actually it helped, you know? And then I, of course, I asked Ryan, does anybody have a copy of it? Does anybody have a copy of it? Nobody does. So there you go. Uh, so that was hard. Next day at school, my teachers started ridiculing me. Uh, my mom's colleagues, you know, oh, that was just the worst thing, you know, that could have happened. Uh, so it was hard because the mentality was still there, you know, that Christianity is the lowest of lowest standards. You know, you can't go any lower than becoming a Christian. But one of my friends at school, who never, we never really got along, I say friends, my schoolmate, he was into heavy metal, you know, long hair, and somehow it never quite gelled. And he comes up to me in the break after all this ridiculing from teachers and making fun of me, et cetera, from friends. And he comes to me quietly and says, did you actually mean what you said yesterday in that meeting? And I said, were you there? He said, yeah, I was there. He said, did you mean it? I said, yeah. I said, my highest respect is to you. And I thought, wow, where you least expect it from, you know, that's where the affirmation, the confirmation comes that God works in the lives of people. Maybe I didn't answer your question, no, no, but that's what came no, to no. mind. What I wanted was a teaser from you <laughs> so that I can ask, would we like Pastor Poroshka next time she comes to speak to us about her experiences in her communist country and coming to faith? Yes? Yep. Well, so now you have the topic for next time you come. Thank you, Pastor Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Denise. And it's an absolute pleasure to be here. And um, thank you for your warm welcome. And look at the, look at the weather. 
don't you just love the sunshine? Uh, it is beautiful. So today, um, I would like to have a sneak peek at the book of Revelation. Now, if you, some of you probably have a big smile on your face. Well, at last, somebody speaking about what is really important. Some of you say, oh no, it will go over my head because of all the symbolism in it. But let's see what the book of Revelations, what is the central message of the book of Revelation is and how it can actually help us today, regardless whether you are new in the faith, regardless how much you know about the Bible, or regardless of what your interest uh, lies when it comes to the book of Revelation. Credit to the people on the screen who did influence my uh, sermon today. First of all, let's look at the book of Revelation. If you have the Bible with you, whether it's on your device or in a, in a hard copy format, if you could open it at the book of Revelation. I'll have the verses on the screen if you don't have one with you. But if you do, you're welcome to follow. It's the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, the last book of the New Testament. And this is how it starts, the prologue. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must happen very soon. He made it clear by sending his angel to his servant, John. Now, if I ask you what the theme or the main message of the book of Revelation is, what would have been the answer? It would have been, oh, it's about end time events. It's about the great conflict between good and evil. It's about how God is going to bring it all to an end. It's about how uh, the, the journey of sin is going to end once and for all. And while that is true, if I ask you what the central theme or the purpose of the book of Revelation is, although many people would give this answer, it actually lies in the very first sentence. It says, it is the revelation of what? Or of whom? Of Jesus Christ. Yes, there are a lot of end time events in it. There's a lot of doom and gloom. There's a lot of hope. However, it is not the revelation of those things. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, if we study the book of Revelation, and that was taught and hammered into me by Dr. John Paulin, who was my teacher, he said, if you sit down and study the book of Revelation, no matter which part of it, and you fail to see Jesus Christ as the central message, as salvation uplifted, you miss the whole point. You miss the whole point. So first of all, let's clarify that the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, you remember my daughter was about eight or nine, and uh, she loved reading. And one morning, I, she gets up and she looks very tired. I said, honey, what happened? Did you, didn't you sleep well? Uh, I was up quite late. You were up late, you went to bed. I said, yeah, but I got up and I didn't want to turn on the light because then you would know I was up. So I just went out, the fire was burning in the, in the living room at night and I sat down and I was reading the Bible at the firelight. I said, what did you read from the Bible? I said, oh, I read the book of Revelation at age nine. And I said, you read the whole book of Revelation? She said, yeah. And she looks at me, Mom, I've got a few questions. And I said, I bet you do. And we started talking about the book of Revelation because the book of Revelation is full of symbols. And we have to understand them and definitely not misinterpret them. So people are drawn to this book, the book of Revelation that is about Jesus Christ. And I made sure that she understood that every part of it, no matter how interesting, fascinating, it is about to uplift Jesus Christ. And of course, it was written by the Apostle John. We say it was around AD 95, 96, so he wasn't uh, young. And uh, it was written on the Isle of Patmos. If you see the map, there is Greece, Turkey, and between the two, a tiny little island of Patmos on the Aegean Sea, or Aegean Sea. And it's only 34 square kilometers, so it's not, not a large island. You can actually cycle around it, you know, in a day. 
and uh, it is a beautiful place. And uh, some people say, why, why do we say that he was in a prison, that he was a prisoner? It was a prison island. And although it's a beautiful place, and we don't know how he was exactly treated, but we do know that it was more the prison of circumstances because he was separated from fellow Christians when he needed it the most. But he put his energy into good use. And he asked God, God, how can I serve you from here? He loved preaching. He loved encouraging fellow believers. Read his gospel, read his letters. And now he was completely uh, isolated from them. And God said, write, write. And he was writing. Then after the first chapter of Revelation, which is the preparation of, of the prophet, uh, to write the rest of the book, we get to chapter 2 and 3. Chapters 2 and 3 are seven short letters to seven churches. You probably heard about them, especially the last one, which is Laodicea. And those seven churches were actual physical churches. You see on the map, the black dot is where the Patmos was, the island. And these are the seven churches that he was writing to. Now, there were more than seven churches in the area. But he picked up on seven churches, and he wrote to them something in symbol that was a physically realist uh, uh, an explanation to what that city or what that church was about. However, there was a lot of symbolism, symbolism in it. They were typical of the condition of the church as a whole, both in apostolic times, these seven churches, and also throughout the Christian era. So you can see there is a double meaning uh, to the prophecies. It's a dual uh, prophecy. It was very appropriate for that day and age for them, each one, but it's also for the Christian era. And uh, if you ever studied them, the last one, church number seven is Laodicea. And this is the era we live in. So as these chapters finish, and as we get to the current era of where we are, this is how chapter 4 begins. Then I looked, I saw a door standing open in heaven, and the same voice I heard before spoke to me like a trumpet blast. The voice said, come up here, and I will show you what must happen after this. Now some of you say, yep, now we are getting into it. We arrived with Laodicea to today, let's hear what's going to happen after this. And maybe that's what my daughter was thinking. Maybe but that's what a lot of scholars think. Now let's get down to the nitty gritty of what's going to happen in the end times. Let's see what happens after this. And instantly, I was in the spirit, and I saw a throne in heaven and someone sitting on it. The one sitting on the throne was as brilliant as gemstones, like jasper and carnelian. And the glow of an emerald circled his throne like a rainbow. 24 thrones surrounded him and 24 elders sat on them. They were all clothed in white and had gold crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumble of thunder and in front of the throne were seven torches with burning flames. This is the sevenfold spirit of God. In front of the throne was a shiny sea of glass sparkling like crystal. And in the center and around the throne were four living beings, each covered with eyes, front and back. The first of these living beings was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a human face. And the fourth was like an eagle in flight. Each of these living beings had six wings, and their wings were covered all over with eyes, inside and out, day after day, and night after night, they kept on saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, the one who was, who is, and who is still to come. And whenever the living beings give glory and honor and thanks to the one sitting on the throne, the 24 elders fall down and worship the one sitting on the throne. And they lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and they exist 
because you created what you pleased. Jesus tells John that he is about to see what must take place after this. But instead of the horrendous pictures of war and famine and pestilence, what we associate with Revelation, he is taken into God's throne room to experience a worship service. It was an amazing worship service filled with strange sounds, even strange lights, lightning and thunder and rumblings in the distance, beautiful colors. If you know those gemstones, if you've ever seen any of them in life, it is just amazing the colors that must have been there. There are some unusual creatures there, some creatures that I don't know, makes me feel a bit creepy. You know, eyes all over them, really? Or, or different faces? However, it is an inspiring example of how to praise God. And you know, by the end of the, the, the verse 11, you feel this awe, you know, of how to praise God and how magnificent it must be, regardless of all the things that we don't understand or can't even imagine. And then we get to chapter 5. And this is an artist impression of what it must have been like, you know, being in that, in that throne room. But when we get to chapter 5, we think that the worship is continuing. It is. But there is something that's causing tension in the midst of the worship. And this is how it continues. Then I saw a scroll in the right hand of the one who was sitting on a throne. There was writing on the inside and the outside of the scroll, and it was sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel who shouted with a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals on this scroll and open it? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll to read it. Then I, that's John, began to weep bitterly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll to read it. So can you see in the midst of this worship service, there's a climax, and it's actually an anticlimax. Because after all this praise, all this worship, there is a problem. Who would think that in God's throne room there could be a problem? But there is tension because there is the scroll, and this scroll has huge significance. Even John can sense it. He, he doesn't, nobody tells him these things, but he can sense it because the worship stops. The worship stops and the question is asked, who is worthy to break the seals on the scroll? And nobody is. Not only in that throne room, but anywhere in the created universe. Nobody is worthy to open the scroll. And probably John senses that there is a huge sadness there, because he says, then I began to weep, not just cry, weep, and not just weep, bitterly weep. He understood that so much is, is centered on this scroll. And if it's not opened, there will be a huge loss and something bad is going to happen. And then it goes on, but one of the 24 elders said to me, stop Weeping, look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir of David's throne, has won the victory. He is worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb that looked as if it had been slaughtered. He stepped forward and took the scroll from the right hand of the one sitting on the throne. You see, this is Jesus lifted up because the lamb that looked as if it had been slaughtered is pointing to Jesus' sacrifice. It all had to do with the salvation of humanity. And Jesus is the one who is worthy. There was a tension, and the tension was solved. There was a problem, and there was a solution. And when the solution presented itself, you know what happens next? 
the worship returns. And they sung a new song. You know, we were learning a new song today. They sung. Even in heaven, they introduced new song. I didn't plan on this. Anyway, and they sang a new song with these words. You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it. For you were slaughtered and your blood has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have caused them to become a kingdom of priests for our God and they will reign on the earth. If you question whether it was Jesus the Lamb who was worthy to take the scroll, now this one confirms it, it definitely was him. Then I looked again. And I heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne and of the living beings and the elders, and they sung in a mighty chorus, Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea, and they sang, Blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one sitting on a throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And the four living beings said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshipped the Lamb. Two chapters we just read from the book of Revelation. Remember when John is told, come with me and I will show you what takes place after that and we get to this beautiful worship service and I and I looked at this passage and I suddenly thought what is going on here why visit a beautiful but seemingly irrelevant ceremony let's be honest we are talking about earth's history what's going to happen why 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 did God put this amazing beautiful worship service right here when we want to see how good and evil is going to finish how the fight is going to finish why not just get right down to the nitty-gritty of it and tell us what really really want to know about the forces of satan and the forces of god but instead we find ourselves here in the throne room you know why God took John here? Because that's where God knew we had to begin. God knows that we have to get our priorities set right. And he's setting us an example of putting him first. We have to realize that when we read the book of Revelation, it's possible to focus on the wrong things. It's possible to focus on, on the mark of the beast or, or on the trumpets or on the seals. And I'm not saying they are not important. Of course they are. But there is something more important than that. God knows that, and that's why the vision starts in the throne room, that if we focus on those things without having the right foundation, we can finish up in the wrong place. Unless we know who our God is and completely trust him, those events that follow from chapter five onwards can derail us. It can derail our faith. So he takes us to his beautiful service that is awesome Yes, there are some odd creatures in the room, but somehow comforting, because at least the 24 elders look somewhat like us. God is worshipped by everything in heaven and earth and under the earth, and not because they have to, but because they want to, because he is worthy. Now, when I was studying these, these chapters, I remember John Pauline kept sending us back, Analyze it again in Greek. Look at it again in Greek. And you go through it and you say, here it is, done. Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. I was wondering, what is he about? How many times can you go through it? He said, no, you can't see it. You can't see it. 
And after a while, it was like scales falling off our eyes as students, because we could see what was happening in that throne room. And then he told us, the best way to understand it is if you go to an organ concert, a pipe organ concert. And being in Europe, we thought, OK, let's do that. So I went to a pipe organ concert in one of the basilicas in, in Budapest. And, um, and when you sit down and you just look at the sheer size of that pipe organ, you know, it's massive, those who know uh, anything about organs. And, and as you sit down, the acoustics are just perfect. But the thing with, uh, with, with this concert that, well, the majority of pipe organs, I set up, the, the organist is at the back. You don't even see the organist. You're facing forward, you're sitting there, and, and as the organ starts to play, the acoustics are just magnificent. And there are different pieces, quieter ones, but, but then it gets louder and louder. And I never forget one piece. It was probably the final piece that he played. And it started very quietly. It was building up, it was building up, it was building up. And it built up so loud. It was beautiful, but by that time you couldn't hear it, but you could feel it in every cell of your body. It was so loud, but it was beautifully loud. And I remember when it came to the climax, when it came to an end, it just stopped suddenly. And, and as the, the sound echoed back and forth and slowly died off, nobody dared to say anything, do anything. Generally, there was applause after a piece. After this one, there was silence. And as it died off, somebody around me, I don't know whether he was sitting behind me or next to me, just quietly whispered, Amen. Amen. And that's when I understood what John Paulin was talking about. Look at with me if you've got your Bibles with you. We are in chapter 5. The seal or the, the scroll can be taken. The scroll is taken back. And, and, and John is happy. All heaven is happy, so the praise service begins. How does it begin? We are in chapter 5, and if you look at him in verse 8, and we had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down to the Lamb. How many of them? 24 elders plus four creatures, living creatures, it's 28. And 28 starts singing in verse 9, and they sung a new song. Can you imagine a beautiful choir of 28 people? I can imagine. 28 who can hold the tune, I can't. So I really appreciate the song service and those of you, it was beautiful this morning, worship God. I need to be led. And these are the most perfect choir, 28 uh, people, well, 24 people and four living creatures. But then, come with me to verse 11. It says, then I looked and heard the voice of how many angels? Many angels, numbering how many? Thousands upon thousands, and 10,000 times 10,000, you do the maths. I would just say a lot. Can you see going from 28 to 10,000 times 10,000? Can you, can you just somehow visualize or audibly imagine the escalation in the praise. And when you think, wow, that's loud. When you think that that can't be escalated anymore. Come with me to verse 13. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea. In the sea. Can you imagine it? It doesn't even say angels or creatures. It, it's just everything that's ever created singing. It's escalating it to the max, you know, where you can't measure it. And that's what I equated when I couldn't hear the, the pipe organ anymore, but I could, see, I could sense it in every cell of my body, the resonation. And when it dies off, that, that climax, when it dies off, look at what happens in verse 14. The four living creatures said, Amen. Can you hear after the millions and billions of creatures singing in a most amazing and awesome choir and harmony, it dies off and the four living creatures say, Amen. And everybody hears it. There is such silence, such awe. 
It is beautiful, isn't it, when you see it, uh, when you see it come alive. And, and we, we know that there is a sense of power here, uh, the sense of wonder, and an assurance, if this is my God, my enemies better watch out. And John must have sensed it, no matter what comes after this, I don't care, because this is my God. And if, and if he is with me, then it doesn't matter who is against me. The images that follow this chapter from chapter 5 to 18 can be frightening and overwhelming. But our God is bigger than anything this world or the devil can throw at us. Amen. He occupies a higher ground and nothing, absolutely nothing, can stand against his power. We will overcome by the blood of Jesus. This is what this is driving home to us. And yes, continue to study the book of Revelation, but in the context of these chapters, start here and always finish here. So what can we take home from this chapter? First of all, the one thing we can learn that we will overcome. Look at that same John earlier writing to one of the churches says, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Exactly the same message. And Jesus says it this way, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows but take heart, because why? Because he has overcome the world. This is the reason we can have peace in this world. We are going to have trouble in this world. I guess I don't have to tell anyone this today. However you read the rest of Revelation, the truth, truth is inescapable. You will have trouble in this world, but take heart because of God, because you belong to Jesus, you will overcome. As one pastor once said, you are either heading into a storm, you are in a storm, or you are coming out of a storm. You know, it's true that God wants to take us from mountaintop experience to mountaintop experience, but guess what? To get from one to another, you have to pass through the valley. And I know that behind each one of you, even behind your smiles, there are challenges, there are valleys, there are storms. Maybe some happened a long time ago, but it's still affecting you. Maybe some you know that is coming, or maybe you are right in the middle of it. Revelation 4 is not only telling us that we'll overcome, but I believe it is also telling us how we will overcome. And we will overcome by following the example of those in the throne room. That's the only way we can overcome. Let's look at what they are doing. They are singing praises. They are worshiping the Father. They are focusing all their attention on him. Everything is centered on the throne in the midst of the room. Why? Because when we do that, when we praise and worship God, when we focus our attention solely on him, on his throne of power, we are focusing our attention not on our circumstances and not on our failures and not on our tragedies and not on the things that unfairly done to us. No, when we worship and praise God like these creatures, angels, and elders in the throne room do, we are focusing upon the God who has the power to lift us out of our despair. That's the one we are focusing in. And that's why the four living creatures cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You think that we are troubled by the things we are going through and what we are witnessing I believe the angels, the living creatures, and, and all those created beings looking down on us are troubled as well just as much. 
God has always been here in the past. He's here with us in the present and he will be with you every step on the way. He understands, he knows, he was one of us. He experienced it, he came to this earth. He knows the heartaches, he knows the hardships, he knows the pains. Maybe not exactly the same, but to the same level he experienced it. He'll never leave us or forsake us, even in our darkest moment. In Thessalonians chapter 5, we read, Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. You know, this sounds nice enough until we find ourselves in a difficult and even painful situation. And then this inspired biblical truth can feel like an insensitive statement. Wouldn't you agree? How can you be thankful in all circumstances? Well, I ask you a question, how can I be thankful? And you finish the sentence. How can, you, can I be thankful when this is the first anniversary without my wife, when, when my family is in such disarray, when I'm in the middle of chemotherapy, when I don't know how to pay the bill? And you wonder, what was Paul thinking when he said, you know, he didn't say be thankful for all circumstances. He said, be thankful in all circumstances. As, as one of my professors once said, Piroshka, um, would I want to live without some of my experiences that I had to go through in my life, definitely? Would I choose it? Yeah, if it was my choosing, but would I want it? No. Because then I wouldn't be where I am with the walk of my God right now. So I would choose to go through every single thing I had to face, no matter how good or bad or ugly uh, it was in my past. You know, people would really like to feel grateful, but their life circumstances at times seem make genuine gratitude almost impossible. They feel that they are stuck in discouragement and disgrace. And Paul's advice is not for us to put on a happy face and to try to bury our emotions. No, it is not about pretending. It's not about denying. But it means that we must look beyond our current circumstances. That's what it means. God, it's tough. It hurts. I cry. Sometimes I'm angry. These are the emotions God gave us. But I know it serves a purpose. I know you allow it and it's going to be for something greater. And keep our eyes focused on him, on the throne room, although it hurts here badly. That's what he did. He said, Father, if it's possible, take this cup from me. In other words, Jesus was telling his father before the crucifixion, Father, if you had plan B, please, this is the time to pull it out, because I would prefer not to continue with plan A. However, if that is your will, I will do it. And he did it. You know, at times we have to readjust our bearings, even as Christians, even as Christ's follower. What does it mean? It, it means to recognize or determine one's orientation, position, or abilities relative to one's surrounding situation. Why am I telling you this? It's because those of you who are familiar with the compass you know a few things uh, when you are dealing with compasses. There is true north and there is magnetic north. I was into orienteering, so I had to be very, very clear about this. There is what we call a compass declination. declination. Does it mean that if you pick up a compass here in Melbourne, will it show differently where north is than if you pick it up in Perth? Yes, it does because there is a magnetic declination. Uh, true north is where true north is, magnetic north is what the needle on the compass shows where north is. Now, if there is a magnetic no declination and you're following the map and following the needle in your compass, you can actually finish up at the wrong spot. And 10 degrees of magnetic declination is quite a lot over a longer distance. 
So you have to keep it in mind and calculate it in. Otherwise, with the right intentions, you can finish up at the wrong place. So is it important for us to readjust our bearings? Yes. Not only when it comes to real compasses, but when it comes to our spiritual compasses. Why do I say that? Can anyone ever with the right intention finish up in the wrong place? Well, let's see what it says in Matthew 7. Jesus speaking, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many powerful deeds in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you lawbreakers. People with the right intentions finish up at the wrong place. Why? Because they go about it the wrong way. It's very important to readjust our bearings. And let's note in this text that what they were doing in service for God, they are big things. Ask any pastor, demon uh, oppression or possession is one of the hardest things we have to deal with. It, you really need to rely on the Holy Spirit and in God to work through you and through the person. Performing miracles, prophesying, these are one of the most, uh, most uh, God-dependent ministries you know, in anyone's life. And these people were doing them. But they somehow lost track of what was really important. And that was to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, to know him. And how can we do that? How can we readjust our bearings? Let me give you two, two pointers. One is daily individual worship, and the second one is weekly corporate worship. This is where we got our spiritual bearings readjusted, our spiritual compass uh, realigned. Daily individual worship, whatever it looks like for you, it's not the quantity of time, it's the quality of time. You need to know your learning style, how, how you connect best with God and connect with him in that way at the time when it best suits you. Just because I do it one way, it doesn't mean that's the only way to do it. But it has to be a growth experience. And we come together weekly. Would you say that there are some weeks when you don't really feel like coming to church? Is it only me? No. And I can see it. But you keep coming because that's what you, keeps you focused on God. And every time when I go to church, like, God, I, I just wish I would have a Sabbath off, you know. But you know what? Every time I walk away with a blessing. Because then you come together, the songs, the stories, even the kids' stories, it uplifts you. It speaks to your heart. And this is the way to keep a spiritual compass aligned. When I think of gratitude in facing of suffering, I want to finish with this story about Martin Rinkart. I don't know if it rings a bell for many of you, but he was a pastor in the city of Eilenburg in Germany in the early 1660s. Now, if you remember European history, this was during the so-called 30 years of war. And Eilenburg, as a walled city, was often overcrowded with refugees. It was a horrific time in Europe, and especially in Eilenburg. And, uh, and Martin Rinkart was one of the pastors in that place. And because of the overcrowding and the lack of food and the lack of hygiene and the lack of medical help, this often led to famine and disease. Conditions were so horrible in Eilenburg that Thousands and thousands of people died in that, in that season of 30 years. And for a season, Reincart was the only minister in town. Now, during this time, he performed up to 50 funerals in a single day, up to 50 funerals. Over his lifetime, he officiated over 4,000 funerals. Can you imagine it? We can only imagine the horrific suffering Reinhardt experienced and helped people through. He wrote several hymns in our hymn book. You can check it up when you go home. 
Uh, but one that's very close to my heart, he wrote in 1636, after he lost his wife and all of his children in one of the plagues sweeping through the city. He wrote this hymn, and I don't know how he had the courage after burying his father and all his children, but this is the hymn, Now Thank We All Our God. And when you look at the words of this, of this hymn, after such a, such a horrific time just ministering to these people, his family is plucked away from him. One would think, what would I do? Would I just curl up in the corner and say, that's it, God? Would I be that Elijah, take me, kill me, I don't want to do it? Or Jonah, you know, would I run? But look at what he does. He writes a hymn, and look at the positivity in that hymn. Thank you, wondrous rejoices, blessed us. And you look at all these words, it is what Paul says in every circumstance, give thanks. And only two negative words are emotion, perplexed and ills, but that's all to be overcome. In the midst of his tragic loss, Rain Card must have been reading from Revelation 4 because he literally quotes from Revelation 4. Why? Why did he write the hymn? Because he understood that what Revelation 4 and 5 is trying to tell us, that in this world we will have trouble, but take heart, focus on God's throne. Set your eyes and your heart and your soul on him who has the power to help you face and overcome your tragedies and your heartaches. And that's what the book of Revelation is all about. There will be trouble but we can overcome, and we can only overcome through the blood of Christ. So as we prepare for some of those end time events to come, because yes, they will come. Yes, they won't be pretty. This is the time where we can still prepare our hearts, train our minds, and try to drive it home into our hearts that the only sure power we have to face the fears and the future anxieties of this world is to focus on God and upon his throne. May God bless you as you continue to do just that. Amen. Amen.